Welcome to another episode of Behind the Dreamers. I'm Jennifer Loading, and we are talking to the achievers, the creators, the magic makers, and the dreamers. These are our friends, these are your friends, and they are living the extraordinary. Well, my guest today, so excited to have her on the show. She's a retired English teacher and dedicated student of life. In addition to her BA in English, she received her MA in education from Harvard University and served as military military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. She was named Teacher of the Year after serving seven years teaching in Louisiana as part of a nonprofit she joined called Teach for America, where they place teachers in areas suffering from chronic teacher shortages. She is now a newly published author, and so I'm super excited to get her on the show. But before we do that, I've got to give a quick shout out to our sponsors because we love our sponsors. So today's episode is brought to you by Walt Mills Photography. If you are a creator needing post-production, consultation, or promotion, Walt is your go-to. Whether short films, YouTube films, photography work, or a new headshot, he can help you find a solution to match your needs. To learn more about Walt and his work, go to photosbywalt.com. We also want to give a shout out to Chris Klo of Upbeat Media Production. If you are in need of turnkey special event production, Klo is your go-to. To learn more about him and his work, you want to go to upbeatmediapro.com. All right. Well, it's time to bring our guest on the show. Victoria Short is the author of Find Your Mini Pumpkin, Life Lessons to Live with Purpose. Her book gives you the wisdom and wide-ranging advice she shared with her students over her long career as an educator. She says she taught thousands of students in her teaching career and mentored many young educators through the lens of literature and decades of classroom interaction She developed a philosophy of looking at the world with a curious and discerning eye. So welcome, Victoria, to the show. I am so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. It's going to be fun. you got (laughs) such a a great uh, background. I love it. I was going through your bio and I'm just like, I just love meeting you awesome people because you guys just all do cool things in the world. So I love what you're doing and how you've taken your all of your knowledge and wisdom and, and made something out of that. Yes, indeed. It's been an interesting journey. <laughs> yeah, I say the least. So tell us a little bit about what inspired how this, I, I know you and I talked off camera, but my audience is going to want to know what inspired you to go from taking, okay, you've been in military, went into education, and now you said, I think I'm going to write this book. What's the inspiration behind that? Well, for many years as an English teacher, I would often find that Shakespeare and other classic works were a hard sell with ninth graders. Um, and they're like, you know, it was written 400 years ago. Why do we need to bother with this? And I would come back with a classic answer as in, well, the 36 dramatic situations are included in this classic literature and it's so relevant. And they would just look at me and their eyes would glaze over and they'd be like, that's not even close to an explanation. You got to do better than that. And so, um, I thought, well, you know what? I'll meet you halfway. I understand that you want lessons, life lessons, knowledge for the future, something that's going to help you in the job market or in your life beyond high school. So I know it's here in the literature and I will try to tie it more directly. And the very first time I made a connection like that was when I was teaching of mice and men. And um, there's a fight scene. And I said, you know, this fight scene kind of reminds me of my dad when he was defending a friend of his who was running his mouth and um, there was a beer bottle involved and my father got his hand sliced up. And to this day, you can see this, this gnarly scar in his thumb for trying to defend someone who didn't know when to shut up. And suddenly I had everyone's attention and they're like, really, what happened? Was there blood? And I'm like, okay, (laughs) hold that thought. I said, but look at Curly look at this character in this chapter, see how he's creating the situation where he's backing himself into a corner and he cannot win. And let's think of what the ways in which people do that in their lives out of pride or ego, or whatever it might be. And they get themselves into these situations and they don't know how to get out of them. And suddenly we're in the midst of a violent confrontation. And they're like, oh, okay. And it was the first time they really made a visceral connection between a fictional work 
and something that could help them in the real world. And that's where the life lessons were born in my classroom. I love it. Well, and that's so interesting that you say that because I think a lot of what I do in my work, I'm actually, I don't know if I shared this with you, but I'm building out a program right now. And a lot of the concepts that I'm trying to get across, they're, they're concepts that are not difficult to understand, but we know that stories sell. And so it's so much easier to try to get somebody to understand a concept when they can see a story versus trying to tell them that this is the message, right? And so exactly. I, I think that, yeah, you're onto something. And it's funny because my my background, you know, my, my previous work, everything that we always talked about was that nobody cared what you did until they knew why you did what you did, right? And so we were always about storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's so clever when you can especially with English, because that was not always my favorite subject. So I, I admire you for that. Uh, I was the math girl. I always say, my husband always says math and English are like, like I'm like, I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> but I admire that. I think it's great that you were able to take those and make life lessons out of those and make them relatable to your students and then transfer that into this work of art that now people can pick up and say, oh, that makes sense. These stories actually can be applicable in real life. Right. It's so funny about English and math because people have a visceral immediate reaction. Like they loved it or they hated it. There's no middle ground. It was right. just a source of inspiration or dread, yeah. which is so funny, which is kind of interesting and unfortunate and odd at the same time. Yeah. Um, well, but yeah. And I realized, especially in ninth grade, when I taught seniors, I was teaching AP courses. And so they mm -hmm. could choose to be in my class. But for ninth graders, they're just taking the, the standard required course. So, you know, not everyone had bought in and really the onus was on me to make it engaging. So they weren't just sitting there watching the clock trying to get through it, but that they would leave with something um, that would be valuable and would resonate throughout their lives. Yeah. I like this. You gave me chills when you were talking about that, because I think so my sister's a teacher and my uncle was actually an English teacher down here. And so we got a little bit of that in our family and I get it, but so many teachers, I feel like they're, it's like they show up to do their job. Like, and I think that's like that in all lines of work, right? There's the people that just show up and do their job. And then there's the people I feel like that come in and they really want to have this impact. They want to come into the space and be like, Hey, I need to make this likable. I can't, I can't make everybody like it, but my goal when I come into this is how do I make this applicable to the people that are sitting in this room so that they can walk away with something, right? Like that's how I feel when I do things. It's like, I want to be able to have something that, you know, even when I'm working with my clients, I say, I don't want them to walk away and be frustrated. Like if they're frustrated, I want it to be because we did some deep work, right? But I want them to walk away with something that they go, that was good. Like I can take away something from that. You gave me chills when you were talking about that. So good. But yeah, that's another way that we show up because if I'm just there delivering a lesson, um, and doing it five times a day and not investing my own passion, they, they can tell in a heartbeat. Kids are savvy. So mm -hmm. I'm also demonstrating that I find the literature worthwhile, but I want to make sure that I convey it to you in a way that it it's alive for you. It's dynamic. And yeah, I mean, kids are watching us. Uh, I mean, I always thought that when I was a student, I would watch my different teachers and I had something to learn from all of them. And even if I didn't necessarily love the subject matter, it was the way that they presented their lessons. There was something there. You know, I want to do that. I don't want to be anything like that. Everyone is a teacher in some form or fashion. And if I'm there for 50 minutes and that student is sitting there for 50 minutes, let's make it worthwhile because that's time going by that we're not getting back. And if we're both invested, we can make something magical happen. Yeah, that's true. And I like that you said that every teacher, there was a lesson in that, because I think that goes back to your student of learning that I said in the very beginning of your bio, because I feel like there's people look at those both ways, right? Some people go, oh, well, that was a bad experience. I didn't get anything out of that. And then there's other people that go, well, it wasn't the... <laughs> It wasn't an experience I particularly liked, but I learned something. I learned I didn't like the experience, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I'm like you in that I feel like everything we do, there's always some takeaway. There's something that can be had when we come out of the situation. You know, maybe- it's Yeah, and that's really what the book is about, about being mindful. I talk about life lessons and they are based on my experiences, but I'm not trying to impart to young people, this is the way to do it. My lesson is being mindful. 
as you're living your life? What do you like? What are you passionate about? What do you not want to miss out on? What is a, a deal breaker for you? Um, what's a non-negotiable? It's not these are the, the pathways. It's this is how you keep reflecting. Um, and because I see so many people, mostly adults, but I talk about in the book too, I would see these students in the five minute passing period trudging to their next class. And I'm like, you're 16 years old, you can't be trudging yet. Um, but I would see adults doing that in the schools, in the community, on the commute. Um, that's an interesting study in human nature, everyone gripping the wheel, you know, going to where they don't want to go, but they're going to get there first. It's a strange world. And I just feel that if people would take a moment to examine why they're doing what they're doing and not just fall into mindless routines, it can be enriching on so many levels. And that's what I hoped to impart to my students. You can agree with me, you can disagree with me. I hope you do disagree with me because that means you're really invested in this topic and you're figuring out what works for you. And that is a lesson that does follow one for a lifetime. Hmm, that's good, Victoria. That's so awesome. I wish I had you for a teacher. <laughs> you sound like such an amazing, amazing teacher. No, I think that this is good. I like the, 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 it, it's kind of like I say too, the, you know, you can disagree, but I think it's, it's, I feel like with you, it's like almost like saying, Hey, like be aware, think, you know, like don't just go with, this is what it is. You can disagree, but, but think, you know, like have some thought process exactly. in this and be self-aware, right? Like, which is, and I share that with you because that's what I always say too. I, you know, like even when I'm talking to people, I don't care if people disagree with me. I just come with, come think, like think about things, you know, <laughs> you don't want to disagree because you just want to be right about something, right? Like it's not about being right. It's about critical thinking and, and, and thinking about, you know, like, what, how you show up in the world, how you contribute to society and how you look at things and take things in and, and value things. So I love it. I, I need to get your book. <laughs> Actually, I think I'm, I, need to, I, I need to get your book. <laughs> that critical thinking piece is so key. You don't want to be in an echo chamber. Yes. You, you want to hear other points of view um, and you want to develop your arguments. And that's all part of it. And that's what kids were doing when they wrote an essay. But again, if they're just looking at an essay as something I need to do, I have to write about Romeo and I need to come up with something and just hand it in by a deadline. It's like you're, you're missing the opportunity to, to develop a skill here. And I know you wouldn't have chosen to read this play, um, but let's get excited about what in this play interests you. Choose something that you have questions about that maybe you have a slightly different, even slightly controversial take on, and then you'll, you'll have the enthusiasm to carry it forward. And then 20 years from now, when you're in the boardroom, you'll remember that you had a slightly different take and you were committed to, to showing your point of view. And that carries on for a lifetime, no matter where you go after mm -hmm. you graduate. That's good. That's good. I like it, Victoria. I like it. Well, I want to ask you another question because obviously we're behind the dreamers. And so we talk about all the stuff, you know, pertaining to these things that we're creating. And obviously you moved into this, you know, author space, which is a new thing. This is like your very first book. Am I correct? First one? It is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's no like easy feat, right? Because I've written a book too. And so I kind of know that process going through. It's exciting and exhilarating, but man, it's, it's kind of a process, right? Like everything. So Indeed. I would love to know from your perspective, what do you feel like was maybe, I guess maybe the most challenging thing creating this, this masterpiece or this project for you? Well, the, I've always heard people say writing the book is the easy part. And I thought, well, yeah, that's easy for you to say you've done it. Um, it that can't be easy, but it's, it's rather true because you have full control. And I had delivered these lessons over so many years, I developed a rhythm and a cadence to them. So committing them to paper seemed like the next natural step. But then I have this collection of lessons. Okay, that's great. Now what? Um, how do you make the leap from your ideas, even if you've scripted them out? And being an English teacher helps, of course, but it certainly doesn't get you started on the publication journey. And that was an education in and of itself. Um, because first I tried to get an agent, Re really knew nothing, just reaching out, doing a little background research. And um, 
I remember I only heard from one, none of them even responded to me. One actually responded with a rejection letter. And I was so happy that someone had actually made a connection and responded. Um, but I thought, well, I could, I could spend years trying to find an agent, trying to pitch this book to one of the big five publishing houses. And that's when I thought, well, maybe it's time to redirect um, how you're going to go about this. And that's when I decided to self-publish. And that led me to another journey of working with an agency, working with editors, designing the audience, the cover, the title. And it went through so many iterations. It's a very different book than it was the first draft. A lot of it got cut and you have to expect that. And I was like, everything's on the cutting room floor. It's like, oh, my baby. You know? They're like, yeah, you, you got to let that go. If, if you want something to emerge that is going to resonate, you, you, there's going to be fluff in there and you got to let it go. So that was interesting. I, I, certainly graded a lot of papers, but now I was on the receiving end of that critique. And I thought, well, that's a lesson for me. Um, so that journey was was educational. And as you know, I'm sure it has its, its peaks and valleys. You get really excited about your concept, but there is a process you need to follow and it does take time. It takes months to bring the, the, the piece together. And yeah, you have to maintain the enthusiasm and the vision. Yeah, you said a lot of really good things there. And I think the big thing that's coming across to my mind right now is when you were talking about, you know, it's your baby and you have this idea, but then you realize there were things you had to cut, you know, and change to, to make it resonate. And I think that is so true with all creators, business owners, people that are bringing something to their their whoever their, their client is, their niche or their market, right? Because we have kind of a vision of what we want and what we see, right? And I'm kind of going through that mm -hmm. right now with what I'm creating. I'm going, okay, this is what I would want. This is what I like, you know? And there's some, there's some greatness in that because you do have something to bring to the table, right? You've got these stories that, that you've collected and you created and you're, you're bringing them in there. But then it's also that fine line of how do we bring what we have so that the viewer gets it and looks at it and goes, I like that. You know what I mean? And it's almost like we have to, we got to give them what they want, not what they need. And then when they get in, they can get what they need. Right. It's like, get it, get it, get what, right. what they want, catch them. And then, you know, so I, I, that, that's great. But also I think too, what you said about keeping that passion alive, staying excited about it. Cause yeah, definitely. I think anytime you're doing something, there's always those moments where you just want to throw the towel in and be like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, there were definitely those moments. And the things that got cut um, were primarily the, the literature. Mm. And what was funny was because they said, okay, well, are you writing about the literature? Or are you writing about the life lessons? And funnily enough, in my classroom, it did morph over time because at first I tied them to the literature, but then they started taking on a life of their own. And I said, okay, we're just going to do a little piece on Friday, each Friday, because, you know, I do have things for which I am responsible, for right. my lesson planning. But over time, it just became about things like regret, avoiding guilt, navigating grief. Uh, and suddenly it got very intense. And it wasn't necessarily that I was saying, consider this character. It's like, consider if this ever happens to you and how you proceed. And then my lesson became, you're not alone because, and I'm trying to think back. I mean, it's a, it's a dim memory for sure, but I try to think back to my teenage years, you know, what was going through my head? And probably I was thinking, I'm the only one that's ever thought this. You don't realize that mm -hmm. everyone goes through that transition. And I think in, in the classroom with high school students, what they really needed to hear is you are not alone. Um, this is normal and however you're feeling is fine, but if you're feeling stuck, here are some things that you can do to navigate the path. And I think when the book came to fruition, it, it started to shift into the focus that had happened in my classroom, that we started with the literature so that they could see it's just a reflection of the human condition. Um, but it, it became more focused on things in their immediate future, like how do I choose a college? How do I know I've made the right decision? And I was always there going, it doesn't matter where you go to college. Um, it's what you do when you get there. It's what you make of the experience. So stop right. stressing and, and stop, you know, spending 
either your money or your folks money going to these private schools thinking that that's going to get you a leg up. It's not what's going to get you a leg up. It's the time that you invested in being studious and thoughtful. Um, that's the real lesson. And then they could take a deep breath and go, okay, I got this. And that's an invaluable gift. And the fact that they were willing to receive it from me in whatever way they heard it was a great privilege. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we had a little bit of a lag there. So sorry if it got a little bit of a delay. It's we're having internet. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's good. And I think so. It's funny because I heard something not too long ago that said, you know, that it's something like that which is most personal is most general. And when you said something early on, how, you know, you like, you think it's only you. And then we realize, you know, as we grow up and we get a little bit more wisdom that we realize that everybody goes through all these different life lessons and the stories are different, but the messaging is still kind of the same. So they can pretty much when you're talking about these life lessons, they can resonate on some level. The other yes. thing I think was neat is that you were kind of talking about like, you know, thinking about the macro picture here, not getting hung up in the weeds of things, right? Like seeing this macro side of things like what's the lesson here the, the the big takeaway you know it's not about the money it's like what are you going to do like where are you go it's what are you going to do when you get there yeah yeah and it's and parents would hear that message too and feel like oh, okay i can take a breath here because we get so focused on the process and it's like and again and this is i i want to instill that that habit when when students are young so it becomes a lifelong pattern of behavior but for all of us, it's a great reminder. If you're doing something, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's not all it's cracked up to be, it doesn't mean you have yeah. to abandon ship in that moment. But really, be thoughtful. If you're going to spend, you know, decades in a career, and it is providing you with a good paycheck, and it's providing you and your family with benefits and security and all those good things, that is important. But you're also demonstrating to your to your family and certainly to your kids how happy and invested you are. They're watching that, too. So it's it's never too late to ask the questions. Is this what I'm meant to be doing? And if you're not thoroughly happy, can you maneuver within what you've chosen to reimagine what it could be? Yeah, um, I did that many times with teaching. I love teaching, but sometimes it, it wasn't the passion it was maybe five years earlier. And I thought, I don't want to leave this. So it's up to me to reimagine what I can do and recapture the passion because that's important. If you're going to do this work, you want to hold on to that. All right. Well, awesome, Victoria. So one other question I want to ask you real quick, what advice would you give to someone that is maybe starting out wanting to, maybe they want to write a book. I don't know. They want to start out and do something here. Um, well, the, the first thing to, that I would tell to students or to anyone starting out, starting over, is don't worry about making the right choice. If you make a choice, just make sure it's inspired by something that you're interested in or passionate about or would like to know more about. I think people are often concerned that they're not making the right step. It's not about making the right or the wrong step. It's about having your heart in the right place, treating people as you would like to be treated, and taking some calculated risks. Um, you know, there's even a part, and I say it tongue in cheek, but I say if you want to do something and you're not sure if you should do it or not, consider the consequences. What's the worst thing that could happen if you do this thing? If the worst thing that could happen is a felony conviction, then you don't do that thing. If the worst thing that could happen is you're simply going to be embarrassed, it's probably something you should try because you don't want to wait 20 or 30 years and have regrets about not embracing something new and discovering what is instead of what could have been. And Jennifer, you've gone away again. There yeah. you are. <laughs> nah, I'm yeah, I'm here. <laughs> we're having we're having technical <laughs> difficulties today with the internet. So I don't know what's going on here. I think it's just we're in different parts of the country, and I think the wherever it's going to the big people, it's getting stuck. But no, Victoria, this has been great. I love it. Well, there certainly you know. was a lot that was affecting the um, air travel today. I saw uh, that. I don't yeah. know if that is in any way related, but I wouldn't 
I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I, I forgot about you. You're right. I got, you know, it's interesting because I had to take my son to, we had to take him to the airport this morning to fly out. And I read that first thing when I got in the car this morning, I saw that about the, uh, the air, the air travels. So yeah, who knows, right? But uh, Victoria, this has been amazing. You're awesome. I love what you're doing, and I think it's I think it's great that you're be able to, you're able to take all these lessons and your journey and your wisdom and knowledge and be able to transfer that into a place where other people can value those stories and use them, you know, to apply to their lives. So, if our audience wants to pick up your book, learn a little bit more about this, where do we want to send them? Well, my book's available on Amazon. Um, and if they would like to learn more about what Find Your Mini Pumpkin means and where to start, they can go to my website, which they can reach at authorvictoriashort.com or findyourminipumpkin.com. Awesome. Well, thank you. This has been so much fun. Thank you. It's been great. I'm glad that I got to meet you and learn a little bit about your journey and um, all the cool things that you have done and, and where you're headed. Who knows? Maybe there'll be another book inside soon. Thank you soon. so much. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. We do want to say to our listeners, of course, if you enjoy our show, please be sure you give us a rating both on iTunes and Facebook. We can't do this without you. And hit that subscribe button on the YouTube. So we can keep sharing all these awesome stories. And of course, we want to leave you with our final parting thought. Same thing we say every week. In order to live the extraordinary, you must start. And every start begins with a decision. You guys take care, be safe, be kind to one another. We will see you next time.